How's everybody doing? Today's video is going to be something that I've been wanting to do for a while. It is very niche, and I think that people who are guitarists themselves or who are just really into certain tones and sounds as far as instruments would find this interesting. Um, I'm definitely that kind of person. I'm very, very, very focused on all kinds of aspects that create an instrument or voice tone, in this case, guitar tone. And as a guitarist myself, I'm very sensitive to it. Depending on how this goes, I may start to do a small series of these, but I've wanted to do this one in particular because this is my favorite guitarist, and that would be Buckethead. So in this video, I'm going to give you my analysis and breakdown of Buckethead's guitar tone. Now, to start off with, I will tell you I'm going to break this down into four different eras. That's the simplest way that I could think to do this, and I will define each era, and I will basically explain the aspects of the tone, how I'm perceiving it, and for each era I will give an example with a link in the description below so that you can click on that and see what it is that I mean, what I'm talking about with those different tones. So you can compare them. I'll try to find examples that are good for side-by-side -side comparisons. So the first era that I'm going to describe, I'm just going to call the Young Buckethead era. This would be from the Giant Robot era up through like Monsters and Robots. To me, this era is defined by high-performance shred guitars, such as ESPs and Ibanez, which he did use during this time. These guitars have very high output pickups. They often had a Floyd Rose or a full floating tremolo. Because of these configurations, these guitars had a very mid-range present attitude on his recordings and in live performances. There is still a lot of warmth to his tone throughout this era, although it is very much in the mid-range, so you don't hear a lot of super low end on pretty much anything, and that's partly due to those guitars, which are mid-range present, and it's partly due to his amp in that era, which I don't know how much of this actually was done with this amplifier, but I'm going to define this era using a PV5150. It sounds very PV to me, and which is again very mid-range present uh, as far as setup. So you have guitars and an amp or amps that fall into that category. Whether it's a 5150 or not, it's very mid-range present and not super low, not super shrill, but just very much in-your-face mid-range shred era type stuff, which makes sense logically. That's sort of the era that he was coming out of as far as when he started to take off as a guitarist. That's what was popular. The second era I'm going to call Macho Buckethead. So we've gone from Young Buckethead to Macho Buckethead. And this era begins with Guns N' Roses, and most critically begins with Buckethead's use of his custom-made big jumbo Les Paul Customs. Now, rolling right into his use of the Les Pauls, I don't think he was using Mesa at that point. I think when he was with Guns N' Roses, he was still using a very mid-range present amp, not a super fat heavy amp, although he quickly did begin to use Mesa amplifiers, which in combination with his giant Les Paul, created this extremely fat, pronounced, low-end resonance, regardless of what pickups he had. And at this point, Buckethead dives into using Mesa amps, primarily the triple rectifier that we know him to have used, sort of know him for if you're a fan. To define this era, I would say to think about the album Crime Slunk Scene, for instance, the tones like you would hear on Soothsayer, or Colonel Austin versus Colonel Sanders, which is probably the heaviest outro guitar tone that you possibly could ever create, that could ever exist on this planet with the materials that we have. I mean, if you play the outro to Colonel Austin versus Colonel Sanders, it is the heaviest guitar tone 
the most aggressive, terrifying, hugest, craziest tone that a carbon-based life form could ever create in this universe. But not only that album, obviously, Buckethead probably made 20 albums with that configuration of guitar and amp right around there, maybe give or take, I don't know. But this is my favorite guitar tone of all time for any player right here because the ability for that guitar and amp to deliver these these low end wailing grooves that just never run out of breath, crushing riffs that could demolish a building. I mean, if you want some more examples of this guitar tone, I would say the greatest guitar tone I've ever heard in a live show would be Buckethead live at Mishawaka Amphitheater in 2006. There's footage of those full sets as well as individual songs available. Look up Buckethead Mishawaka, M-I-S-H-A-W-A-K-A, -A -A, 2006, and check out any of those renditions. That is the craziest guitar tone I've ever heard, and I've Never heard anything else even come close to that. Except for some of his own other shows in that era, like the Italian American Social Club, etc. And this is also where he used my favorite single guitar of all time, which would be his custom-made white Les Paul Custom that's fully white. The one that has the exposed bobbins on the pickups. I believe he had two of those jumbo sized white Les Pauls at least. Um, I can picture the one with the exposed bobbins and one with covered pickups, but the one that he primarily used was with the exposed bobbins and that guitar sounds like nothing else that has ever been made that I have ever heard. Even within the realm of Gibson custom instruments, which now I have a Les Paul custom, that thing is one of the best sounding guitars ever doesn't really come close to that giant Buckethead Les Paul that he had made in that specific one. Even Buckethead's later on signature models for his own signature don't even come close to that, but I'll get to that later. So now we get to the third era, as I'm gonna call this experimentation. So we went from first young Buckethead, second macho Buckethead, and now experimentation. And this era in my mind begins in 2009. So my suspicion is that Buckethead's previous guitar with the exposed bobbins was probably using some kind of Alnico pickup. I'm guessing this, there's really no way to know what pickups he had, but to me, it sounds very warm and full and across the full frequency range, it is just very, very fat sounding, pulling out all the harmonics and there's really not a whole lot of natural dynamics to those pickups. The dynamics that he had in his playing with that guitar was basically brought out by his playing. If you look at the way that he was positioning his hands, his pick and everything, he was manipulating that guitar physically rather than getting dynamics out of the pickups, but it did sound extremely warm, which makes me think that had Alnico's. Beginning in 2009, I believe Buckethead is using ceramics. And now he's using a totally different guitar with a black headstock, which I believe was probably the artist proof that Gibson would have given him when they were developing his signature model that came out the following year. So Gibson will usually do what's called an artist proof, I think that's the term, where they create a guitar, give it to an artist, they sort of make their tweaks as far as what would become their signature model, and then they turn it back in and create the guitar based on that. That's, that's my understanding of it. I could be wrong, but that's more or less what it was. I believe Buckethead's Les Paul in 2009 with the black headstock was probably the artist proof. So while this guitar actually did sound phenomenally good as well, as far as the pickup output, I think that guitar traded a lot of the full frequency band fatness for a more dynamic pickup output think about Albino Slug or Siege Engine in particular, that's got a much more dynamic and a little bit higher pitched leaning pickup sound to my ear than some of his previous 
sort of legacy albums had. I think what I'm hearing is that artist proof being played on Siege Engine. And I saw him live, actually my first concert ever was watching him live in 2009 with the black headstock Les Paul and he played Siege Engine and I'm pretty sure that that was the guitar on that album as it was recorded. Anyway, at that point, the following tour that he does after that 2009 tour with the black headstock, Buckethead begins to use his signature Gibson Les Paul, which comes from the Gibson USA lineup at that time, although it has front binding to look like a Les Paul Custom. I don't think it was made in the custom shop, I think it's a USA model. And this guitar sounds much closer to the black headstock Les Paul from 2009 than his actual original custom made Les Paul that I would have thought of him for. So this guitar, we know the specs, it has a 496R500T hot ceramic pickup set. That's the one that has two kill switches that are like the big arcade buttons. You can probably picture it. But this guitar continues in that direction of a more higher pitched, less fat and more dynamic output. It's sort of a more modern progression. In addition to his new guitar tone at this point, Buckethead begins to change amplifiers. And this is where we get into the Buckethead Pikes era, and I believe he changed amplifiers quite a bit, particularly in the first 100 to 150 Pikes albums. I think he went through a ton of different amplifiers. So at this point, he's, I, I think around 2010 or 11, when he was starting to use a signature, he was using Mesa's, but he was using something other than a triple rectifier. I think he was trying to find something that was more modern or different sounding, but he, at that point, begins to abandon the triple rectifier, tries a Mesa, a triple crown or something. I could be wrong, but something that was clearly not a rectifier. He clearly didn't like it. He didn't stick with that sound either. Then he blatantly switches to Marshall for most notably a tour that I saw him at, which was maybe 2012. And then if you think of the Pikes album, The Shores of Molokai, which is a must listen, by the way. That album is clearly recorded on a Marshall JVM. I've had a Marshall JVM. I've heard them before. I've heard Buckethead playing live through JVM. That album was definitely recorded on a JVM. But again, a Marshall JVM is a very mid-range present amp where it's like, you know, between PV and Marshall, it's like PV is very mid-range present and kind of transparent and Marshall is very mid-range present and here's our character in your face and that's what he was using for a short stint and then I can't really confirm this as far as having seen it live but for a lot of the Pikes albums it sounds to me like Buckethead is using I'm just gonna say German amps if you can picture like uh, the way that a German amp typically sounds very level, like all the notes are almost like compressed and equalized to sort of equal each other out and it sounds very cool across the board. It sounds to me like he used like some sort of German metal amps throughout that era. I mean, I'm, I'm probably the least versed in those, but I can definitely pick out how they engineer their sound to be. And I'm pretty sure he was using them here and there throughout the Pikes albums. It's a very sort of cool, fluid sounding, equal sounding guitar tone. Um, think Worms for the Garden. I couldn't really tell you what exactly that amp is, but it sounds German. And there was a bunch of other albums that were recorded probably with that amp or something similar. But that's kind of out of my wheelhouse. It's worth saying also at this point that from where Buckethead's guitar tone was made famous, let's say throughout the mid 2000s, you know, 2000 to 2009, it would be completely unrecognizable from that point to that sort of middle of the pikes point with 
the very fluid sounding amps and a totally different guitar if it weren't for his playing characteristics. It would be almost an unrecognizable guitar tone. So now let's get into the fourth era, which is the final era, and I will call it the current era, at least as of the time that I did this video. So after years of experimenting with different amps throughout the Pikes albums, Buckethead settles onto an amp that he seems to stick with. And not only does he stick with it on the Pikes albums primarily, but he plays live with it exclusively, which becomes the EVH 5153 50-watt 50 ivory head. And I can tell you that it's 50 watts and it's ivory because he's been seen playing it live. I've seen him live playing that amp at least twice. So this amp is very fluffy, which is actually a way that Rob Chapman described it, which I think is very accurate. It's fluffy and it's very cool in nature. Similar to the German amps, but it has a little bit more character, but it has this also sort of fluffiness to it. But at this point, this is now totally opposite to a Mesa to my ear. So whereas a Mesa might have a very aggressive, roaring, growling, fat tone like it's gonna kill you, now he's on this fluffy cloud with this brighter sounding amp, with a brighter character, with this fluffy gain structure. And at this point, Buckethead actually takes it a step further and he starts to use his signature studio version in many cases, both live and in studio. So this guitar sounds notably different to me. You might wonder like how much of a difference does it make between his signature and the studio? And I'm sure there's a lot of people that would say there's no difference. The only thing that matters is the strings and the electronics, but it does make a difference. The studio model has a baked maple fretboard, which not a lot of people realize this, but it's a maple fretboard. It's just baked really dark. And that guitar does sound quite brighter and it sounds more articulate as far as how the fretboard can articulate rather than you know, ebony or even rich light on his original signature model. So this admittedly does bring out a little bit more character to how he's able to play things with his fingers and a little bit more brightness. Although the brightness is somewhat negated by the fluffiness of the 5150, in my opinion. But this is a very now bright and fluffy and happy sounding tone versus the macho aggressive tone that I think many people came to know him for. And I've seen one or two comments on videos of people sharing a very similar sentiment that, you know, they miss his old tone or whatever. Obviously it's a distinct difference. There's a clear evolution over time and it's clearly well-researched. I mean, Buckethead has gone through a number of different guitar and amp combinations throughout the past, let's say, 10 years in particular to land on something where he is now. So here's sort of my closing thoughts now to round this video out. So first of all, it's no surprise that my favorite out of all the eras was his Macho Buckethead second era that I noted here. This being the original Les Paul and Mesa rig. It was the most badass thing I ever heard growing up. And before I knew anything about how to accomplish it or could even play guitar very well or even years before I ever even had a job and could buy a guitar or amp, I knew that I wanted my own guitar tone to be largely based on this type of tone more than anything else. For whatever reasoning he has, which I'm sure it's good reasoning, Buckethead has gone completely away from that overwhelming, powerful sound. But in a way, he also has kind of come full circle because if you think about how I originally defined his first era as a PV5150, whether or not that's what he mostly used or not, that's how I think of it. He ended up back at another type of 5150, albeit from a different company, totally different design, but same family, just 20 years later. It's basically a more modern version of what he planted his roots with. And he ended up on a guitar that 
being the signature studio that is closer, although definitely better than some of his original shred guitar uh, instruments that he used. So in a way, it's kind of like he came full circle on the amp sound, but into a more modern conclusion. And his guitar sound went from crazy overbearing fatness to a modern guitar with a lot of good mid-range and a lot of articulation. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad move, although I've seen some people here and there comment saying they miss his old sound. I can understand that, but I think it's a very well thought out, well researched evolution of his sound that we're seeing. With that being said, I would absolutely love it if he would go back to using his old guitar and using a Mesa, and I think that would be a really cool throwback, but obviously it's not what he wants to do, it's not where his heart and ear is at this time, so I wouldn't necessarily want him to do that. So if you're watching this video as a Buckethead fan, just go ahead and leave a comment below as to which era was your favorite of his guitar tones. I think everybody can agree that they were different. So we've got Young Buckethead, Macho Buckethead, Experimental, and Current. So which one out of those was your favorite and why? If you like this video, don't forget to share it and subscribe, turn on notifications. I may consider doing other guitar tone analysis in the future, depending on the response this gets, although I just really wanted to do this, so I may just do it anyway. But yeah, turn on notifications, turn on the bell to all notifications, that's the thing now. But I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you guys next time.